First, the powders are precisely weighed in well-determined ratios, and then thoroughly mixed. It's important that all components have the same optimized grain size. For this reason, the mixture has to be thoroughly ground in a ball mill. Ground powders are pressed into molds similar in size and shape to the final pieces. Once the yttrium, barium, copper oxide crystals have grown, they become too brittle for subsequent forming. A small seed crystal is now placed on the mold to produce the desired orientation of the new crystal which will grow from the pressed powder. The seed should be structurally and chemically compatible with the 1-2-3 phase, uh, but it should have a higher melting temperature. And quite often if you take a different rare earth bearing cuprate, samarium bearing cuprate and neodymium bearing cuprate, you can use that to seed growth yttrium barium copper oxide. So YBCO has a lower peritectic decomposition temperature than neodymium and samarium. Uh, so you take the seed crystal, you place it on top of your sintered YBCO at room temperature. You then heat it fairly rapidly to above its peritectic decomposition. You then cool it to just above its solidification temperature and then you cool slowly through the recombination temperature at which point the peritectic reaction is reversed. The 2-1-1 reacts with the barium cuprate liquid to produce the 1-2-3. The AB plane grows in a very symmetrical way, but the C axis grows in a less symmetrical way. And this gives, gives rise to growth sectors. Now if you look in the AB plane, which is the more rapid direction of growth, one sees uh, a square uh, fold symmetry indicated by facet lines. These are the same facet lines that you'd see if you observe the growth of single crystal silicon using a tr Trakowski method. They're mainly indicators of crystalline integrity. <laughs> The superconductors are very helpful to generate high magnetic field and, on the other way, we can use a strong magnetic field to make uh, very good superconductors and uh, I want to explain it. In this area, we process the superconductors and material in high magnetic field. All these apparatuses are superconducting magnets cooled by liquid helium that can go up to 4 or even 8 Tesla. So uh, we use the magnetic field uh, to align the solidifying crystallite in uh, superconductors like YBCO, gadolinium bacchio. Because those materials, you know, they have very anisotropic properties in the superconducting state. But above the TC transition, they also got some anisotropy in the paramagnetic susceptibility. Then you have a new effect which appears in high magnetic field. The shape anisotropy, which is due to the square susceptibility. And uh, it is a square because it is the effect of the magnetization created by the element on itself. This is a so-called demagnetizing effect. And if you put uh, an elongated object uh, made of iron, for example, then it will align with the longest direction parallel to the applied field. And this is not due to the crystallographic anisotropy. This is only due to the shape. Because you need to take into account the demagnetizing energy, which is half n m square. And this n is related to the relation between the magnetic field and the shape. This is a superconducting magnet which generates eight Tesla and we designed a special furnace to fit inside the magnet. The furnace is non-magnetic and we try to uh, reduce the interaction between uh, electrical currents and high magnetic field. This is a drawing of uh, magnetic susceptibility measurement at high temperature. This is a cryostat with the superconducting magnet we insert the furnace inside the cryostat, we put the sample in the middle of the furnace and we measure the magnetic force acting on the sample with an electronic balance. During the process, an actual process which lasts about one week, then as a function of temperature, we measure the susceptibility. And we have some drawings like this. This is the YBCO being heated. When we heat up, the superconductors, the susceptibility decreases with temperature, it's a Curie-Weiss law. Then we have a very strong increase of the magnetic susceptibility. This is a melting, because in the liquid state you have magnetic copper ions, much more magnetic than the solid. 
in the liquid state, you have uh, copper 2 plus ions, which uh, is magnetic. And uh, if you lose oxygen, then you have copper plus, which is non-magnetic. When you melt the sample, you have a lot of oxygen in the, in the solid, so you have mostly copper 2 plus ions. So you have a very large increase of the susceptibility. This is melting. This is oxygen loss. This is oxygen uptake. At higher temperature, the susceptibility decreases for two reasons. One, this is a curry vice law, so it's decreasing with temperature. But also, this is an open system, so we are losing oxygen, and the valency of the copper is changing from magnetic to non-magnetic. Now we cool down the sample, and we have oxygen uptake and temperature decrease. So for both reasons, the susceptibility will decrease again when you come from higher temperature. If you have a good uh, equilibrium with oxygen, so you have liquid which is very magnetic and you solidify and you see exactly the reverse. So we have a strong decrease of the susceptibility. And this is solidification. And what is the most important in this process is the solidification temperature. Because in order to grow very large single crystal, you have to spend a lot of time in this very narrow window with the help of this measurement, is to go straight to this temperature, then to slow down and to wait for the solidification to take place. And in this case, we have very, very large crystals because we have very little nucleation, but very large growth. And of course, in addition, the material is magnetically aligned. Because we have a peritectic reaction, we have two and one in a barium cuprate liquid, Although these two components combine to give us a 1, 2, 3 phase, we could actually equivalently start with 2, 1, 1 and barium cuprate segregated. And the way that this occurs is you take a 2, 1, 1 block, you sinter the block. On top of that, you take a second block of the balanced barium cuprate required to make up the 1, 2, 3 phase. Um, you then put a seed crystal on top of the arrangement. You heat it very slowly, uh, at which point the barium cuprate melts first. It then infiltrates into the 2, 1, 1 phase. Uh, and then on cooling, the 1, 2, 3 forms. It's a very good way of making sure that you've got a very good dispersion of 2, 1, 1 uh, and the barium cuprate liquid. For most bulk applications based on trapped magnetic field, um, it's necessary to have some specific conformal geometry. If we take the hockey put type geometry, well that's useful for things like magnetic bearings, but most applications, for example motors and generators, require some specialist geometry. So that means you either have to process in complex geometry, and that's difficult because the melt processing technique follows the growth front, or you have some method whereby you can multi-seed uh, in a specific geometry. If you use a multi-seeding technique, however, then you get grain boundaries, and you've got to be very careful whether those grain boundaries occur. Now, if the grain boundaries are fairly low angle grain boundaries, less than about 10 or 5 degrees, then they don't really impair the current flow, and that's good. We use seed crystals. The seed crystals are the Marium 1 to 3 material, which has a higher melting point. And we use these seed crystals for growing large grain samples, so called single grains. We increase the number of seeds. We start from two seeds, have here four seeds, and even eight seeds. You can see here the single domains one. 2, 3, 4, etc., 16, and you see here 16 single domains in this ring. In theory, it's possible to have a single coated conductor and a, an array of seeds, and these seeds can be used to melt process growth just as it would in bulk. Uh, the problem, however, is that these seeds have to be aligned. Uh, if the seeds aren't aligned, there may be some interruption in growth, there may be grain boundaries, and the longer the conductor, the more seeds that are going to need, be needed. So there's a real materials processing challenge here. The individual grain boundaries count, and there are many of them, and the distance between them is not so great. And so there can be segregation to these boundaries, which limits the critical current. Engineering offers so many challenges for superconductors over the coming years. There are a number of problems, and they require solutions. And we need the very best material scientists, engineers and physicists working carefully together if we're going to further develop the field.